Mm. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to our monthly-ish webinar series. Um, today, we're going to talk about something, uh, medical decision-making, um, how to approach treatment decisions. They are, can be exquisitely difficult moments for all sorts of reasons, which we'll talk about today. But today, we're going to sort of lay out a basic approach to making sound medical decisions. Um, and of course, there's other ways to skin this cat, so please chime in with however you might approach decisions, et cetera. But we're gonna offer you at least a structure and then we can bounce off that together. All right. Mm -hmm. Sonia, you wanna give us some little prompts here? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I just wanted to let you know um, how we answer questions and interact with you guys. So one of the ways you can do this is you can click on the little raised hand button and we will call on you and unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Um, there's also a question area where you can type a question and we will read it out loud for you and if you have anything that comes to mind while someone else is speaking or you know telling their story you can use the chat um, area way down at the bottom to just kind of type your thoughts so if you guys want to keep an eye on that you know if someone says something that really resonates with you please feel free to, to add a comment about it so again you can raise your hand and uh, we will unmute you and you can ask verbally or you can type your question in and um, we have been sometimes we end up going over without being able to answer um, everyone's questions so please know if that's the case we will record a second session where we do answer your question and all of those recordings will be sent to you uh, tomorrow. Thanks again for being here. All right, thank you, Sonia. Um, just to sort of hammer home that one of the points that Sonia made, we're trying to figure out a way over the course of these webinars to get more interactive, uh, meaning you, uh, us together, but also you guys together. So responding to other people's comments or questions or throwing out ideas, et cetera, is super, super welcome. Again, that push, put, put those comments about other people's comments and questions in the chat, and you can look there to kind of go have some back and forth. I'll try, but try to keep an eye on there too to maybe read some of those comments out loud as they come up. But that's the idea here, guys, is to begin responding to one another as well. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, one thing to acknowledge, I mean, the healthcare system, making medical decisions, so a lot of what we're going to talk about today implies that you are engaged in the, in the American healthcare system, such that it is. Even no matter what you feel about it, no matter how much interest you have in um, taking their meds, um, the healthcare system is kind of hard to avoid. In one way or another, you're going to either bump up against it to say no thanks or to go with what they're offering. Um, so just a, it's a big, enormous industry. It's a, it's a beast with huge amounts of momentum. There's so much churning the wheels of healthcare in this country. And I just say that to, you know, so as, as a little individual person stepping into this big system, it, it has, it, it can compel you, it pulls you through. And before you know it, you're kind of hopping from medical appointment to medical appointment, and it can become, it can subsume life. So that can be very helpful, the momentum of pushing you one thing to the next, the next treatment, the next appointment, you can get some momentum. And as, as, as in life, momentum can be very helpful, but it can also, if you're not careful, it can sweep you up and take you down river before you know it. So um, one way or another, you need, to, like, you need to find a way to kind of keep one eye on the ground and one eye on the horizon too. And every once in a while, look up to make sure you're, the care you're getting is the care you want and the care you need. Um, and it's another thing to throw out right out front here, guys. It's implied already in a couple sentences or statements, but it is more than okay to say no to treatment. Just because your doctor is suggesting it, first of all, doesn't mean he or she thinks you should do it. And you should ask them that. Um, but just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. And just because someone else does something with treatment doesn't mean you should. So there's a lot, there's freedom in here. There's a lot of moments to make decisions and choice. But those moments come pretty quickly. You might feel unprepared for them. It's hard to understand your options, et cetera. 
Um, but if you don't make these decisions, you'll chip down these default pathways, which often aren't where people want to be eventually. So the idea, and we've said this before in these webinars, gone are the days where you just hand yourself over to the doctor for so many reasons. We just don't have a healthcare system that can, uh, can that, that works that way anymore. We're all we're so many specialists. Most of us have several doctors. There's not necessarily a primary care doctor whom we know for years, who knows our family, knows us inside and out, to whom we can trust to make decisions, sound decisions on our behalf. Because this is subjective realm. I mean, what works for one person is not going to be right for the next person. So the idea of the Marcus Welby days are probably gone. Um, it's not to say you can't find trustworthy doctors. It's just the way that things are structured. It's very hard to just kind of trust that someone's going to, a doctor or system going to take you where you need to go. So you need to advocate for yourself, um, whether you're a caregiver or a patient, this is teamwork. Okay, sorry, I'll get off that soapbox. Um, you know, so part of the way to make a good decision with medical stuff, and this isn't exotic to medicine, this is making important decisions in life in general, consequential decisions. So part of that, you know, step one really is sort of getting, taking stock of your situation. What are you looking at here? You know, the, the medical pathways are pro forma, are, you know, these sort of flow charts, you know, your age, comorbidities, other things that kind of slot you. But we, of course, are more than the pathways could ever do us justice. So you have to understand your, yes, your medical situation, of course, to some degree, to the degree that it's understandable, but also your financial decision, who is in your life, like who, friends, family, strangers, neighbors, who can help out? Uh, it's pretty impossible to go through uh, intensive medical treatments entirely alone. Um, one way or another, we're going to be leaning on others. So who do you have to lean on? On whom do you have to lean? <laughs> um, what resources? What's your insurance status, et cetera? What's your living situation? Um, so taking stock. And part of taking stock in the medical world, especially with advanced illness, often involves knowing your prognosis. So prognosis is, you know, um, first of all, sorry about the noise, um, but first of all, medical science um, is not, we're not good at prognosticating. As uh, you know, we get make estimations based on experience, based on trends, based on pattern recognition that happen over time across a population. So of course, any one of us is different from the norm much of the time, or at least some of the time. So huge grain of salt whenever you're taking in a prognosis. But before you even take in a prognosis, it's really helpful actually to think through, you know, how much you actually want to know, especially with prognosis, which is a, is a best guess of what the future holds for you, how much time you have left to live. Uh, and again, that, knowing that guess is often wrong, but it might get you in a ballpark. And so a lot of us will make different decisions for ourselves if we've got three months to live versus three years to live. Um, so the prognosis can be a really, sorry for the noise here, guys. It can be a really important part of contextualizing your illness, and therefore contextualizing treatment decisions you need to make. So, the funny thing about information, though, is our brains, you can only take in so much. And there's always sort of a smoldering tension and anxiety when it comes to health and healthcare, almost always for most of us, in the background, which can, can affect how well we're thinking, how well we're processing and listening. So very often you're going to have to ask your doctor to repeat information, make sure you really understand what he or she is telling you, ask good questions. Sometimes you need to be a sort of a fly anointment and just sit there until you get your questions answered. Um, but here's a really important key. This slide here. I want this is a very this is a this is something of a novel idea. In the past, it's sort of like what to do with your prognosis. But whether or not we're prepared to actually hear our prognosis is a very important question. You know, some of us, it's we might not want to know this best guess how much time we have to live, because then we have this feeling of a clock ticking, or you know, there can be a pressure versus staying open-ended and you know, who knows, I'll take one day at a time. And that one day at a time approach can be really helpful and wonderful for some people. I will say though, someone in your team, a spouse, a friend, someone in the team has to keep an eye on prognosis 
otherwise we can, this one at a time thing can lead you down these pathways again that you don't want to necessarily be. So somewhere, somehow, someone has to keep an eye on a best guess of how much time we have left to navigate the clock well. So here's this tool. It's all preamble for this tool that our friend Steve Shire made uh, in the wake of his working with his, his wife, Amy Doppelt, who died uh, uh, eventually. But as Steve was reflecting on his experience, you know, he realized what, what, they, what really helped him and Amy was to have their hand on the spigot of information, the flow of information. It wasn't whether they wanted to know, it was more of a timing of when to know certain things. So Steve, who's a very smart, thoughtful guy, came up with this tool as a way to communicate to your doctor how much you actually want to know. Doctors may avoid the prognosis question altogether or kind of just drop it on you uh, in an insensitive way. So thinking through this tool can help you control the influx of information so that you can keep up with it. Very smart thing to do. And this tool will be available to you guys. Um, I, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to make sure you can see it. Steve is happy to share it with the world. So, okay, so that gets us to goals of care. This phrase you may have heard, it's sort of increasingly a phrase to be found in healthcare. Um, it means kind of what it sounds like. What a, so as you approach a treatment decision, what's well, very helpful, because we said to take stock, get a sense of the context of your situation, of your life. And then, of course, it's also very helpful to know, you know, what is it that you're hoping for? What is it that you hope to gain from going into treatment or by saying no to treatment? Um, it's very helpful to have that hope in mind so doctors and you can make choices that are in line with those hopes. Uh, super, super critical. So this goals of care phrase is, um, is something that any of us can do anywhere along the way. And it's, you know, our goals of care change over time. So what's important to me now may, now may not be so important a year from now, et cetera. So goals of care is something you revisit. It's a dynamic thing over time. Um, so, but that's, that's the basic gist. Uh, and so once you've got your sort of context, take stock of what you have, once you get a sense of what you hope for, once you have a sense of the prognosis to contextualize those hopes, you know, hoping to live forever, well, that's a miracle. Hoping to live another year, well, that's something a doctor can say, well, with this treatment, that might may be more or less possible, et cetera. Um, so that's the sort of basic process by that you go through to get to a good decision that you can live with. All medical decisions are fraught with trade-offs. I'm not aware of any decision that doesn't have some pro and con associated with it. And so you're often making decisions based on the, sort of the least, sometimes this is the least crappy decision available to you. Um, but hopefully we can get into the positive round too. Like what is it you're hoping for and what treatment decision will align with that hopes with where you want to go in this world in your one life. Okay. And then the last little piece of this kind of approach, this goals of carry approach is this basic communication. And certainly, you know, you got to say these words out loud. You got to let people who are close to you, you got to let them know what you're, what's going on so they can help guide you they can help support you so sharing your de your decisions with others is very important so that everyone can be aligned obviously your medical team but your friends and family too um, but this for the slide actually we should probably say it's not just telling others but listening to others most of us don't make great decisions in a vacuum and because our decisions affect one another our families and friends etc it's it's often very helpful to hear from them so talk these things out you know we go with treatment A or treatment B, what's that look like? What's the impact gonna be on you, honey, or whatever else? Uh, uh, and of course, you might get ideas from friends and families too. So tell others your choices, yes, but actually you know, deliberate your choices with others too. Uh, again, we don't live in vacuums, so we shouldn't make decisions in vacuums. Uh, okay, yeah, all right. So that is our slide, our slide deck kind of groundwork. Um, let me see if it's sort of succinct enough. Medical decisions. You, know, you need to, so let's review real quick. You need to be active in this one way or another. You and the people close to you. Someone needs to be active and engaged with medical decisions eventually. You can't just hand yourself over without expecting some amount of disasters. You have to participate in these choices. That's first 
point. The second point is when you're coming up against a treatment decision, contextualize it. Get a sense of what you're looking at, what your options are, uh, the context of how much time you might have to live, whether you choose to know that or someone in your care team knows that, um, your resources, et cetera, taking stock. And then as you go into that decision, really get a sense of what you're really hoping this will do and talk about that with the doctor. Will this treatment actually satisfy this goal? Uh, share that goal with your doctor so they can align treatment with that goal. And then a uh, last point here, again, is, is confer with your close and peeps. Make sure you're making sound decisions not only for you, but also for the people around you. Okay, that's the basic gist. Um, I'm gonna take off the slides here, guys, and then we can open up for a conversation. Um, love to hear from you. Does this make sense? Um, does this comport with how you guys have made decisions? Anyone want to have any comments or questions or want to share their approach or what's worked well for them? Also, as ever, the negative examples can be very informative for us too. So if, you know, if you've had an experience where a decision was made in a way that didn't serve you so well, that can be very instructive to share with the group too. Um, so, any hands up, guys? Let's see here. Let me see if I can. We actually have a question from Kenneth um, in the question section. If you want to read that, let's see here. Ken, hi, Ken. Um, Ken's question, how much do you think we should expect from our doctors on selection of a clinical trial? Well, can I make, uh, how much should we think we should expect from our doctors in terms of communication um, or advising? Um, so I might need to hear a little bit more specifically what, you, what you're asking about, but let me just start by saying, clinical trials are very much their own uh, it's its own kind of world and very so if you're going through general treatment pathways um, and, and there are not many other options or good options for you then sometimes people will then look to the latest research what's going on in the experimental world that might help us so those that's the world of clinical trials um, and that very often means when you're interested in a clinical trial, it often means your 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 normal, your routine doctor, say your oncologist. Very often, a different oncologist steps in who's leading the research team. And very often, so one thing to get clear is you might have a totally different team uh, navigating the trial. And the really big thing to understand about trials is they are designed first and foremost. The point of any clinical trial is to find out whether or not there are uh, risks associated with it, side effect profiles, etc. So the purpose of a trial, yes, we, any clinical trial specialist will hope that the trial, of course, helps you. But frankly, the expectation is that it not. In the trial world, you're trying, your you're, the hope is to learn from your experience. So that's really, really key. Um, you, your expectations going into any big decision, obviously, are important. And the expectation of a clinical trial is not that you're gonna be cured or something like that. If that happens, wonderful. I mean, obviously that's the hope, or if not cure, more time, et cetera. But the clinical trial is a process by which we learn whether or not the drug is safe for you. So know that when you're going in. A lot of people I've talked to have and, and gone down the clinical trial pathway and are kind of excited about it being research and there's an energy around it. But first of all, they, they may have not realized that almost by, almost by definition, clinical trials are relatively last ditch. They're late in the game. It's usually something you try when other things haven't worked. So almost by its nature, by being in a clinical trial, we know we're far down the road. And then lastly, again, I'll just repeat, is the expectation is not that it's necessarily going to help you. It's more that they're going to learn from your experience. All right, so there's a lot, so that's a lot to, that's oftentimes is barely spoken. So Ken, back to your question, you probably need, if the clinical trials are on the docket, you're gonna wanna be very active in your questions. You're gonna wanna push them. Their primary goal is, is the research, not so much helping you. Of course, they want to help you too, but again, the goal is the research. So really, you need to push. Okay. Oh, and Ken, thanks for the follow-up. So the selection of a trial, how much can you expect your doctor to help you with the selection of a clinical trial? 
Well, just keep in mind what I just said. You can expect it, especially if your oncologist knows you well and knows your goals of care and what's been important to you and how you've responded to other treatments. A frank conversation of saying, hey, doc, do you think this clinical trial, so it's available, but do you think this actually has a chance of helping me? What's your opinion? What should we look out for? When do I drop out of a trial? You know, because you can do that. If things aren't going well, you can drop out. And that's fine. You don't owe anybody anything. So you want to make sure you're on really good footing with that doctor and asking the questions. Otherwise, left to their own devices, they may just say, well, there's a clinical trial, and that implies hope there's something else to try. But you're going to need to push them about what to really actually reasonably hope from it. Okay. I'm just going to go down the list here, I guess, a little bit. Well, we've got a few hands up, so I just want to get to those really quickly. Hey, Kim, you've had your hand up for a moment. I'm going to unmute you real fast. One sec. It's just taking its time to unmute you, but it should. Up here. Okay, one sec, Kim. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm gonna mute you again really quickly and come back to you. And Sasha, I'm gonna unmute you instead. One sec. And while Sasha's is unmuting, um, just so everyone knows, there is in the handout section, uh, there's a prognosis declaration that BJ mentioned in his slide. So if you guys wanna download that, you can do that in the handouts and we can also send it out tomorrow. And I don't know why unmuting is not working with anybody. Hmm. Okay, BJ, yeah, go ahead and go to one of the other questions. Okay. All right, guys, bobbing and weaving. So Douglas, um, how does one deal with the imbalance of information knowledge? We often don't know what to ask or can be overwhelmed by technical terms. Well, hey, this this is such a good point, Douglas. It's hard, even if you have a, your doctor thinks they're communicating with you, they often will be using terms that make no sense. And again, we're often, by definition, under stress when we're in these appointments where we're not able to take in information very well. So this is where you or, or a caregiver coming in with you needs to just make sure to ask the doctor to repeat. If you're sitting there hearing them and not sure what they're telling you, it's just, it's as simple and as difficult as interrupting and saying, hey doc, I'm not sure I understood that. Can you go over that one more time? Or um, sometimes asking docs for their opinion. You know, what do you think doc? I, I get upset with my colleagues for not answering that question. Very often they'll, they'll deflect. Um, I think that's a very reasonable question and you may need to push your doctor. Um, so there is an imbalance of information and knowledge, uh, but oftentimes that imbalance is just with the cosmos, not just between you and your doctor. Oftentimes there's a lot that the doctor's not going to know either and you're making educated guesses. But in answer to your question, Doug, I think, or sorry, Douglas, it would be just simply, just like anything else, if you're not getting what they're telling you, push them. And if you think they're giving you a narrow answer to your question that you need a big picture of, ask for that. Um, and you may need to have a second appointment. You go home, realize, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I'm not sure I understood that. Schedule a second conversation. Very rarely should you feel like you need to rush into treatment. There are certain situations where there's really no time or very little time. But most of the time with advanced illness or chronic illness, there's time to, to sit and think about it. Because you're going to want to proceed with confidence. You don't get to know where this is going to head. Your doctor doesn't even know where it's going to head. No one really gets to know. So you just need to walk into the unknown with the confidence that you, the idea is have confidence in your decision. Was it the best decision you could make with the information you had? Um, so hopefully that helps your, your question. Again, just stop the doctor and don't leave until you understand what they're, what they're telling you. Hey, BJ, uh, it looks like both Kim and Sasha ended up typing their questions since the unmute was acting funky. So could you read Kim's? Uh-huh. Let's see if I can find it. Um, I don't see Kim's. Do you? I see Sasha. Kim should be right above to... Sasha. No. Hmm. Not in my line, it's Anthea's. Okay. Let me go ahead and read it for you then. In the case 
where you have concurrent diagnoses that are comorbid and two specialists perhaps not communicating well with one another, how could one handle a situation where one doctor is comfortable discussing prognosis and one avoids the question? How can one reconcile those conflicting prognoses? Well, this is where it can be very helpful to have some sort of primary care or some someone's got picture, big picture in mind. A lot of specialists, as you're saying, will focus on there. So a nephrologist is going to be looking at your kidneys, a cardiologist is going to be looking at your heart. Um, and that's there's some strength to that in our, med, our medical system, this sort of super specialization. The hard part is there's not a lot of help putting it all together. People will sort of divide you into little pieces, but we're not so good at reintegrating you. So you often have to be that force. So I, you know, first off, do you have a primary care doc or someone sort of got the big picture in mind? Um, and if so, talk with them to sort of synthesize conflicting or different information. Um, if you don't have that, the benefit of that, then it's kind of, it's back to you to advocate. So you can go back to the other doctor and say, what I've heard from my ex doctor is in conflict with what you're telling me. Can you help me reconcile the two? Sometimes squarely asking those two doctors to speak, that may or may not happen. Sometimes the nurse, a nurse practitioner or a care coordinator in one clinic or another, by request, can reach out to their team to try to get some clarity. So um, I think the point here is to not proceed until you feel comfortable um, that the dis this disparate information has somehow been reconciled. Sadly, though, sometimes it's on you to push until that is reconciled. Again, that's why so much the name of the game with medical navigating our healthcare system is advocacy. Um, okay. Let's I think see. next um, in the question, do you see the question from Cheryl? The top. Cheryl A. Mm -hmm. How can, yeah. How can a severely ill and disabled patient navigate the healthcare system? Canadian, in this case. Uh, entirely alone with no family or friends ever involved and with no advocates, social workers, or any other help available. Well, Cheryl, that is not easy. Um, I mean, just to acknowledge that right now, there's, there's no putting an easy spin on that. Um, we're truly alone. Um, this is where, you know, I sometimes folks who meet that description manage to have a very close relationship with their physician especially a primary physician. And you may, if this is the situation for you, you may schedule much more closely routine follow-up visits rather than waiting for something to go wrong. Whoever the sort of quarterback doc is, scheduling more routine visits to check in and explain, make sure that that doctor understands your situation. That's really just the two of you making these kinds of decisions. Um, you know, that, that, that can be very helpful. You need some sort of partner to help you make to navigate the system and that could be your doctor uh, so part of it is you communicating your situation and the isolation that you're experiencing to that person so you have something of a and, and can ask them can you be my partner can you help me navigate this can you help me make decisions very often if you ask that doctor they may have ideas of how to get you to a social worker or care coordinator and i don't pretend to know the canadian system but at some point, there's a safety net that you can uh, engage, at least in the U.S., and sometimes that has to do with your income level, et cetera. But reaching out to the Department of Social Services can be a helpful, again, in the Canadian system, I'm not sure what that would be called, but somewhere, I'm assuming that in that system, there's going to be a social worker somewhere who could be of help, um, so asking. Um, and then lastly, I think, so when you're really alone in this world, navigating all this, um, advanced directives, doing your paperwork, because you can't rely on someone else advocating for you. So filling out your advanced directives, making sure your wishes are stated and known by the healthcare system is really, really key, even more key when you're alone. Um, and then also sometimes neighbors, strangers, putting yourself in the way of help from strangers can come, can be set up for disappointment too. But there's no easy answer to your question except for to look among the resources that you have and work with what you have. And it may just be that one doctor. The last thing to say is palliative care and hospice. So if you meet criteria for hospice, that's the closest way you have to sort of getting a 
it's a, to renting a family of some kind. And the, the sort of interdisciplinary care of hospice can come from the social worker, chaplain, et cetera. So if you qualify for hospice, that can be a way to get a lot more help, a lot more support. Shy of hospice, looking out for a palliative care program, which can approximate that sort of interdisciplinary uh, holistic care. So I would point you to, if, if you qualify for any of those kinds of services, I would engage them, I would enroll them. Okay, let's see here. So now I'm just gonna go down, should I just go down the list? Um, yeah, let me read Sasha's question since she, we, we had tried to unmute her and it didn't work out. So Sasha said, how do you counsel or empower patients to choose safe caregivers or providers to deliberate their choices with? Um, okay, can you, I just realized I was reading this, this comment that came in when you said that. Can you, can you read that again, please? Of course I can. How do you counsel or empower patients to choose safe caregivers or providers to deliberate their choices with? Ah, uh, to find safe people to, to, sh to share the decision-making process with? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, you know, it's very often, very often you just need someone who listens well. Sometimes just aren't saying these things out loud. You'll make, you'll find your way. You'll answer your own questions. So first things first, I think the most basic would be someone who listens pretty well that you can just think out loud with. Um, beyond that, in terms of who would, who would be a good candidate for this role, they need to, you have to have some confidence that they don't have other agendas beyond your care in the mix. Uh, so if they're competing agendas, that can quickly get chaotic and problematic. Um, so someone who listens well, someone who doesn't have other agendas, that can be a relative stranger. Sometimes like in our families can be so freaked out by their own, by this illness themselves that they're, you know, not, not very helpful, consumed by their own anxieties. So maybe someone who heretofore you haven't known all that well who sort of meets this criteria. And sometimes it's a stranger or a peer. You know, a lot of people will meet someone in the infusion suite in a cancer center and become buddies. And in peer-to-peer -peer counseling, bouncing ideas off each other can be very, very helpful because you're in similar shoes. So peer support, either informal, just bumping into people like, like you meet them in the clinic, or peer support groups, uh, that can be very helpful. Uh, so those are some ideas. Again, someone who can listen well, hear well, and doesn't have another agenda. Um, related, uh, I saw the comment that was distracted that came in was a really good point of advice, especially for the comment before about someone being alone in the healthcare system. Again, knowing that many of us just can't take in all this information or are not hearing well when we're under stress. Can be very helpful to take out your phone and just record these conversations that you have with the doctor or with a friend helping you make these decisions so that you can revisit the details. It's amazing to me how this uh, a conversation may feel one way or two people walk out of that conversation with totally different opinions about what which just said. So repetition, uh, recording it, listening to it again can be very helpful. All right, so shall we go back to the question, Sonia? Let's see. We could try to unmute someone again, just for the fun of it and hope that it works. Um, Vera and Harold, I'm gonna unmute you real quick here. Okay, it looks like it worked this time. Are you guys there, Vera? I am, but I didn't have a question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hi, Vera. Hi, good to listen to you though. I don't have a question at the moment, thank you. Okay, okay. nice to hear your voice. <laughs> um, okay. Shall we go back to the list here? Yeah, there's a good question from Carl that says, should I have an advanced directive or a pulsed? Okay, Carl, great question, thank you. Um, probably both, and they're a little bit different. I mean, the pulse, so the advanced directive, guys, same thing as a living will. It's the legal document by which you get to state your wishes for your care, especially at the end of life, and to name your healthcare proxy. That's probably the most important piece of an advanced directive is to name that deputy who, if so if you find yourself in a situation where you can't communicate, you can't make decisions for whatever reason, having a trusted person officially involved as your healthcare proxy to speak on your behalf is hugely important, hugely valuable. We should all have an advanced directive, even if we're perfectly healthy, we should all name that healthcare proxy. So that's an advanced directive, always useful, always relevant, something that we should all have on file and update over time. A post 
it's an acronym. It stands for the Physician, uh, physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Some states use a, uh, call it a MOLST, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. But anyway, PULSE is generally accepted as the lingo. And PULSE is a newer document, sort of a companion to an advanced directive. Excuse me. Much more distilled down. It's one page. Very often it's like this hot pink color, front and back. It's basically a distilled advanced directive including a slot to name your healthcare proxy. The thing, the difference between a pulse and an advanced directive though, is a pulse is actually signed by your doctor and that's what the physician's order. So once it's signed by a doctor, that document becomes a medical order. So there are legal implications to a pulse. An advanced directive, doctors, hospitals, uh, paramedics often find reason to not uh, honor an advanced directive in real time. If there's any lack of clarity, et cetera, they're just going to keep, they're going to do their thing in the acute care setting. They're going to, they're going to perhaps push past their advanced directive. Very often the advanced directive can't be found in the heat of the moment. Whereas a pulse, very often people will have it like on their refrigerator or somewhere very accessible. If they're living with serious illness, they know this could happen. So they'll keep a pulse close by should the paramedics arrive to have the pulse. Not only does that state your wishes, but because it's signed by a physician, has legal protection for the paramedics and other doctors to honor it because it's, it's, an, it's a medical order. So that's the power of a pulse. Pulse has become more important, a more critical document to have as you're at the van farther advanced stages of chronic illness, when death is increasingly a possibility, um, and when complex treatment decisions are increasingly on the table. So that, that's when really to have a pulse. Uh, two different documents, both very important. If I had to pick one document to have for any of us to have in this, uh, if, uh, you know, the Pulse is, has, again, this extra layer of being a doctor's order, uh, extra likely to be honored by the medical system you're in locally. Okay, hope that answers your question. That's a very good one. Thank you. Sonia, where are we? Let's see here. Just working through the line. Mary's had her question up for a little while, if you want to read that one. Mary Donovan? Mm-hmm. All right. Hi, Mary. Um, any strategies on protecting our wishes when we're not with our peeps or able to speak for ourselves? Um, I've known several people who were intubated, feeding tubes, and certain steps they didn't want because their advocates were not around. It was very difficult to reverse those steps once taken and in that momentum of care you talked about. Short of carrying around our advanced directives or getting tattoos, some people do, um, or wearing some kind of med alert bracelet with our wishes, any thoughts to communicate to those in that situation? Well, yes, thank you, Mary. That's a really good point. Um, and I, I think we kind of got at it a little bit with, so one answer to your question is having a pulse, that one piece of paper. Um, it's easier to put in your wallet, it's easier to tape to the fridge. So that, that may be part of an answer to your question. Um, in, in general, protecting your wishes, uh, never mind the paperwork, a lot of people just get in the habit of telling, it almost becomes a joke. Every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, you know, Grandpa Joe's tell, tells us every time he doesn't want to be resuscitated or whatever it is, you know, this almost get in the habit of talking about it with friends and family and your clinical team. So to your point, Mary, sometimes the family aren't around in the heat of the moment. But if you just, if you've seated at many places, your doctors, your nurses, anyone who will listen, if they know who you are and they know your wishes are much more likely to be honored. Um, but otherwise, you're right. I mean, this is without that paperwork, it becomes a liability issues. And in the heat of the moment, medical professionals may need to respond with intubation and acute care interventional steps if something doesn't interrupt that pathway. So there's no real easy answer to that question. The closest we have are the things we've discussed. But uh, uh, beyond the paperwork, again, I would just communicate it loudly. You can make a joke of it. Just let anybody and everybody know your kinds of your your wishes, especially if they have to do with saying no to interventions, no to the ICU, no to the ventilator, et cetera. Um, it's not much of an answer to your question, Mary, but that, that's kind of the best we have. Um, okay. Let's see here. Any hands up, Sonia? It doesn't look well. Let's see. Kenneth, do you still have a question you'd like to ask? Okay, 
maybe not. Let's keep reading the questions. All right. So, Heidi, as a doctor, I find that patients will make decisions only to be talked only to be talked out of the decision by a physician offering a treatment that is verbalized to be only for palliation. Example, goals of care conversation in which a patient verbalizes he has no intention of going back to the hospital and was investigating hospice options. Treating physician, I will call him one more time to see if he wants one more trial of experimental treatment before possible BMT. Um, so yeah, I mean, it sounds like more of a comment. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, it is true, we are impressionable. And a lot of us are also, there's a thing that happens where patients don't wanna disappoint their doctor. So just by virtue of a doctor offering a treatment, very often the patient will just go with it because, well, they really, they just don't wanna disappoint their doctor very often. It happens a lot. And, and this situation that you named, Heidi, which is, which I find so sad, where someone has finally kind of done the hard work, coming to terms with their situation, a much more realistic idea of what they're facing. Very often that means electing hospice sooner than later for most of us at some point. And only to find a, another doctor swoop in and sort of offer this last ditch thing and up in the apple cart. It's, it's, I've seen it happen many times and it verges on negligence um, sometimes because very often what's being offered as a treatment is not really expected help. It's just for some reason, some of us just can't tolerate the idea of hospice or can't tolerate the idea of saying no to treatment. Uh, so this does happen a lot and it's, a real, it's very sad when it does. Um, I've been a part of that, I will say, as a, as a younger physician, where I'm being in a goals of care kind of conversation with the family, we're imparting very difficult information and the family, are, you can see, are sad and upset but are wrapping their heads around the idea that there really aren't any good treatment options per se, coming to terms with it. And then only to hear a well-meaning doc sort of with feeling all that palpable pain in the air around having no good decisions to make anymore. And they'll just drop this sort of false like, well, we could do X, Y, or Z because it's just so intolerable to not offer something. First of all, offering hospice is offering something. Uh, and this happens a lot where the doctor's discomfort actually is the thing that's driving the, the, the visit versus the patient's needs. So all I can say is I to acknowledge your point, Heidi. Sad but true. Frustrating and disappointing to use your words. And this is where medical education, yes, this is about us as patients empowering ourselves to make good decisions, whether or what, no matter what our doctor is doing. But a big piece of this going well uh, over time is revisiting medical education, preparing doctors better to talk with people about the realities of their situation and uh, benefits of hospice and the realities of death. So we got a you know, long way to go on the medical side. Okay. We do have another hand up. I believe it's Rick. Rick, you're unmuted now. If you still have a question. I do. Hello, BJ. Hey, hey Rick. How are you? <laughs> Okay, pal. Um, it's so lovely to see you. Um, mm -hmm. I love this prognosis declaration. I really do, because um, these type of comments come up a lot in some of our virtual support groups. Um, and just about two, two weeks ago, uh, a guy opened up a subject that he said was really bothering him, a guy who was diagnosed de novo metastatic prostate cancer. And his doc said to him, you don't want to die from prostate cancer. And he didn't know how to respond. So he brought it to the support group. Mm -hmm. And um, it opened up a topic we rarely talk about. And it was a pretty stunning topic. And it reverberated because people in our caregivers group also brought it up. And um, this prognosis declaration, particularly if it's signed early on, uh, would hopefully be a way to stop that type of comment. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I, I love this tool, Rick. I, Steve, I was so happy when Steve came up with it uh, for all these reasons. I mean, even well-intended doctors sometimes just put their foot in it, say, you deliver information that someone's not ready to hear or withhold information that someone really needs to hear or with bad word choices sort of suggests certain things that stick in a patient's mind and torture them. You know? So controlling 
controlling the flow of information is a really good use of the pension to control things. Um, and by the way, everybody, Rick is a wonderful person. Um, he runs uh, the Answer Cancer Foundation, ancan.org, which is a wonderful website and resource with the, uh, all sorts of information and support groups, some disease-specific support groups. It's a, Rick, you do beautiful work. So thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just love seeing you. This is such a, you're making me smile. I'm going to be smiling the rest of the day, VJ. <laughs> well, me too, now with that voice in my ear. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. Um, okay, let's see. Who else we got out there? We've got a question that's been up for a little while, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. I think it's from Anthea, and it's, do you generally suggest getting second and third opinions following a diagnosis? Great, great question. Thank you, Anthea. Um, really important question. So these days, um, in some oftentimes like oncology is has is, is gotten much more sort of uh, standardized so there are protocols so the care you're going to get at one cancer center is very likely to mimic the care you're going to get at another cancer center and the information you're going to get is very often redundant not always um so you might get just the right information from that first opinion um but so the reason to get a second or third opinion yeah, you may want there may, there may be other opinions worth hearing, but very often the benefit of a second or third opinion is the reassurance that the uh, that the advice you're getting is consistent. The idea here is not only to make a it's not just to make a decision; it's to make a decision that you can live with. And as you know, the rest of life, you know, to have confidence to really know in my bones that I've made a decision, I've thought through, that I'm not missing a beat. Very often that means me looking at a situation from a couple couple different angles, getting advice from a couple different angles. And that way you can kind of triangulate your way to, uh, even if the advice is the same, you may walk out of a second or third opinion conversation just having that much more confidence in the decision you do make. So I think it's often, if you're in any way doubtful about your decision, if you're in any way sort of bothered by, well, gosh, is this quite right? And what if I don't do it? Hmm. Then I would get a second opinion um for all these reasons again just the goal again is to have confidence not just to make a decision thank you anthea um okay and there's another good one um from lori here that i can read out loud how do we balance a patient family level of hope particularly when it is perceived as denial with this decision making process so hints for bridging the miracle treatment versus the reality of prognosis. Mm -hmm. So this is really important. It comes up all the time um, where there's within a family dynamic or between a doctor and a patient, um, there may be you know, differences of opinion of what's possible or what the hopes are. And hope is such a tricky thing. Hope is this very powerful force. It can really compel us through, through daily life. It is. Um, in, and it's interesting, you know, one of the, the main reasons that doctors, and this is this is from research, that the main reason, to the degree that doctors don't share the full truth with their patients, the number one reason that doctors, the reason why doctors do that is I'll tell you, they don't want to take away hope. They don't want to dash someone's hope. And I get that, um, but the problem here, of course, is that you, know, you end up perpetuating false hopes if you're not careful and just kicking the can down the road a little bit and setting that person up with the false hopes to be even more des uh, devastated once the truth finally seeps in. And it happens all the time. I think the key with hope is to realize it's not this monolithic, first of all, it's doctor, not a doctor's job or it's to give or take hope. You know, hope is needs to be contextualized. So uh, I, I need, and we actually also know that supported truthful conversation doesn't actually kill hope it actually makes people feel better so that's just a little primer on hope and why people get weird about it so whenever i hear the word hope you always just get in the habit of saying hope for what you need to, need to contextualize it hope to live forever okay like we're saying that's a miracle zone hope to make it to granddaughter's graduation in the, the summer that's much perhaps much more realistic so voicing these hopes uh, making sure that we get clarity on it get specific and once you uncover uh, uh, misaligned hopes, hopes that may border on miracle, well, that's when I love to say, you know, when a patient of mine shares a hope that seems very unrealistic, 
then I might find a way to say, not like, oh, you're crazy. What kind of hope is that? Simply say, oh gosh, okay, I hear you. I love to use the word miracle. Like, I'll hope for that miracle too, because then we've kicked it into the not likely to happen, not in our control to happen. But you can say, I hope for that miracle to happen too. But can we take a minute and think about what happens if that doesn't happen? What's a good plan B here? Try to respect that hope, but also talk our way into other options into the mix too. And that way you can bridge this divide that hope can, can open up. Um, hope can be a wonderful thing or it can be really, uh, uh, in a way, a cruel thing when unrealistic. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question, Lori. Jump back in if I didn't quite get it right. We've got another one here. Um, do you have any experience with VSED, which is voluntary stopping eating and drinking? And if so, what is your opinion? So VSED, guys, is so in uh, so aid medical aid in dying. Uh, that's the latest language. It's a uh, um, legislation that allows for, in the context of terminal illness, that I, as a physician, could prescribe you lethal medication that you would use to end your life at the time of your choice of your choosing. Um, at this point, um, so that, that was kicked back from the Supreme Court to the states, and Oregon was the first state to have a law like that on the books in 1997, and since then, uh, thanks to advocacy work at the state level, more and more states are bringing laws like this online. I think we're up to eight or nine now. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's aid and dying. That's actually getting help to end your life. So um v said is always legal is always possible it's based on our rights as as a legal protected right as patients to to say no to any treatment we always have the right to to say no to treatment we don't always have the right to demand a certain treatment that that power rests with the physician but we always have the power to say no so based on that sort of ethical underpinning v said is a way that someone who wants to hasten their own death can do so um, without trying to overdose or do any other ways that we can might end our lives. Um, so it's a rough road. So you can live for about a month without food. For the for most most bodies can go about a month without food, but you can't go much more than a week without fluids of some kind. So voluntarily stopping eating and drinking usually means that within a week or so, if you're really not taking in any fluids, within a week or so, death is likely to come. That's always in your control to do that. But it can be uncomfortable. Thirst, hunger, uh, sort of boring pains that come with hunger um, and thirst can be can be very difficult. And literally waiting around to die for several days can be very emotionally taxing. So B said can be a hard route to go, but it is always legal and it's always within your rights to do so. If you're gonna go that route, I'd still want to have some support, whether that's home hospice or someone around to help with symptoms, chapstick. Uh, drops to keep your mouth from feeling so dry and just basically good human support uh, moral support can be very helpful so that's v -set. I don't necessarily recommend it but if that's the only option people have and they're committed to hastening their death that is the way to go okay I think we have time for one more question and we do have a hand up here Andrea I'm gonna unmute you Andrea, are you there? Hi, BJ. Hi, Andrea. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. My, my, I, I want to just add, I have a peculiar way sometimes of making medical decisions. I've had to make some very heavy ones, you know, life and death type. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I finally get down to, all things being equal, is you know how they throw out percentages, X number of people, like 80% do great, but 20 don't, or however you work it. And until it's 100%, somebody lands in the pot who survives. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in my mind, so I always go, well, if there's 2% of people, I mean, not knowing the risk is death defying, let's just say, um, I, uh, then I go to, well, somebody survives. So I'm going to say, yeah, I already know all the information. I already know a, pr a procedure could kill me. So then I go to this kind of data and I, I find that really helpful. 
you know, that, that there's a, there, there are people who get through things. I'm one of them. And, yep. um, yeah. And, and, and it's hopeful because I can imagine being in that 2% or 10% or whatever. And so I go with that mental model. If I have to, if I'm deciding that I would rather uh, live than die and I have to go through something very, very intense that could kill me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that's served you well, hasn't it, my friend? Yeah, uh, really could, well. Yeah, and I, and I think you're pointing to something like we were saying earlier that these decisions are trade offs. There's not, there's you're not going to get 100% certain. Are you there? Can you hear me? This is freezing. I don't know why. Uh, I can't hear you. Hmm. Okay. Well, I can hear you. I was just going to say that. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Well, you know, you're reminding us that these are these, these are relative risks, and very few things are zero percent chance or a hundred percent chance. So, just getting a sense of the trade-offs and where you are, what's likely to happen, and how much of a risk you're willing to take, and what you're willing to give up, all of this stuff is so relative. So, keeping an eye on percentages and impulses, competing impulses in yourself. Very often, that's the work of making good decisions: is bouncing these things, weighing these things one to the other and making the best decision you can with it. Yeah. And you roll with it. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you, um, Sonia, do we have time for one more? Any other? Let's see what time is it, guys? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we are, we've managed to get through the raised hands and the questions, so we can just go to our question um, at the end of the slides, if you wanna do that. Great. All right, guys, let me put the slides back up here. And just a reminder, while BJ is By pulling those up, um, we will send out a recording via email tomorrow morning. All right, guys, so here's a takeaway question. We'd love your responses. And by the way, if you love the art in these slides, thanks, Sonia. I, this is her handiwork. It's freaking awesome. Um, all right, here's the question for this for this go around. Shoot us your answers and we'll make them public. But how do you make important decisions? You know, so we've laid out a little bit of this sort of goals of care structure. Uh, and it seems like a pretty good generalized way to make decisions. But any refinements or any ways that you make decisions? Andrea shared a little bit with us. Anybody else? Uh, sometimes it's gut. Sometimes you flip a coin, whatever it may be. Share it and we'll share it with the group. Um, but otherwise, guys, that's it. That's our hour. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for participating and for being here uh, and for your patience with our technology and all that stuff. And it's just um, it's really nice to see you guys. Um, we really love doing these monthly, and we'll, be, we'll keep at it. So uh, have yourself a lovely weekend, and we'll see you next time. Where is the, hmm, I think that stopped.